what are some of the things you'd like to see? You know, just like to give some of your feedback. You know, as as now school is coming to an end for you. Yeah, well, now that school is coming to an end, I can be a little more involved. Yes. And, um, you know, put. What area do you see that you like the most? What part of it? Um, helping the community. I mean, getting paid to be a community advocate and find out what the community needs are. Um, I'm very passionate. I was thinking about this this morning. I'm very passionate about the Coachella Valley. I grew up here. Okay. I left. I, I left. I went to New Jersey. I've lived in New Jersey. I've lived in New Mexico. I've lived in Georgia. I've lived other places. And I came right back home because I don't think people realize the wealth that they have down here of it kind of uncomplicated living, really. Um, mm -hmm. If if they That's would just tap into it, there, you know, the, the traffic I can deal with. The, I'm, I'm, you know, two hours from LA if I need to go. There's a lot to me. There's a lot of benefits to living down here in the valley, and for me, the valley has always been a very safe place. So I would like to see our underserved communities, our black communities, even our Hispanic communities and other communities that have migrated down to the valley um, become more vocal and more active and more aware of what they have available to them. Because I don't think they know. Yeah, and there's so much stuff. There's so much to do. Like, I feel like if people don't know, there's like a lot of choices and people just think well, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, I watch a lot of crime shows. So back in the day, <laughs> back in the day before they got a criminal database, a, cr a criminal could go from town to town or state to state and commit crimes and there was no communication and no way to share that information. So you didn't know what was going on from from one location to another with a certain criminal. The same serial killer could be, you know, in LA tonight and then up in Northern California tomorrow and there's no communication. Well, if we create some type of communication for underserved people, for, um, you know, the people that we are planning to serve, that we put all of this information together and we connect them with the resources. Some of them don't know that there are resources out there for them. I didn't know that I could, that that was available to me. I didn't know that I could get that. And so if we make that available to them, I think that's a way to help them um, and ease some of the red tape that, that we often have to go through to get the, through, you know. Hey, Nikita, we're on Zoom here. Huh? Yeah, I sent her a message on I'm sorry, you can't hear me anymore? Hello? No, no. Uh, Nakita joined our Zoom. So we're trying to get her back to oh, No, I'm sorry, she joined on Teams. We're trying to get her to Zoom. But yeah, I agree. Actually, there is not much communication despite the cities never really, they don't really have borders when you think about Emma, that. Emma, we're on Zoom. Okay, I'll be right there. Okay. Uh -huh. Everyone is on teams. <laughs> this is this is one of the cool things about having great technology, right? Mm -hmm. that, that now everybody's like, where are we? We do all of our internal meetings on Teams, uh, but our external stuff we do on Zoom still. So that because everybody doesn't have Teams. But Candace, as I was listening to you, I'm sorry, Billy called me just as you were talking. But um, I did, so I didn't hear the very end of what you said. Could you, re, would you mind repeating that for me a little bit about the um, community connection thing? I kind of yeah. caught a little bit of it, but I didn't hear the whole thing. Yeah, no, I was just saying that, you know, I'm a, I'm a crime, a crime show buff. And I know that back in the day, there was no database connecting um, different offices, you know, police departments to know what was going on from state to state or from town to town. And so, you know, that lack of communication caused problems. And I just see us developing, using that as a comparison, I see us developing some type of directory that would help the underserved and, you know, the people that we're looking to serve 
be be connected with these resources and know that they're out there and find an easy way for them to connect to housing and resources and jobs and food and and a church home if they need it just a one-stop shop where they could find everything they need i'm looking for this can you help me well yes of course here you can go to our directory and this is where we can direct you to and it would just you know just to make it a little streamlined for 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 the process you know i i think it is important especially given the technology that's here today that we really help people understand how to safely use that technology but how much power comes with using that technology you know yeah. you mentioned earlier you know having left home and now coming back to you know back to the valley and I really do. I I agree. I mean, I I I see many people who I meet in the Coachella Valley who are like, I always wanted to be home, but it wasn't easy to be home because resources were not available. The reason RAP started there, the name is Regional Access Project, because it was about the fact that when they started about 30 years ago there was no hospitals in the desert there were no med there was no medical treatment so they people got sick they had to go to riverside if they if, i was born i was born in riverside general hospital there you go i mean you know so so you know so so things have improved but i think there is a gap of the haves and the have nots and how they get access to that improvement. Absolutely. So I think we have a great opportunity to bring to bring the tools that people can use to be able to come together. You know, we just had a really good meeting with some of the pastors from the area. And they were like, we are, we've been waiting for a chance to get together. You know, so I'm like, okay, well, now the chance is here. Let's go do it. You know, let's not, you know, don't let our egos get in the way of what we can do. Uh, sometimes that's the hard part. Miss Jade, I see that you're there. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. So the question of the evening started out with, what would you like to, what do you like about We Are One? What would you like to see us do going forward? How would you like to be involved? So please just share your answers. Um, The one thing that I like about We Are One United is that, that we're, you know, like we're trying to actually like help the youth, get the youth to truly understand the community and um, just everything about it. Uh, one thing I would like to see is, uh, I want to say like more communication between, um, events. Cause I know I only come out on Tuesdays and there was something mentioned about like Monday night. So I was like, I was really confused about what you guys were talking about. And then right. just like, um, just including everybody in like the events and like keeping them in the cycle. That's good. Thank you. That's important. Right? Thank you for saying that. You know, um, uh, we we think we're communicating with everybody, <laughs> but inevitably it depends on who's actually sending out the message. And so we have to get better at that. I think that's an opportunity for us to improve what we do. Um, but I thank you for, you know, because we do want people to feel comfortable participating. But I also think the other thing that is happening is um, we've grown our staff, you know, adding people. But at the same time, we haven't necessarily um, made sure that all of our outreach is is you know kind of consistent i think that's the word the best word i could use so so i'm excited that um 
that you brought that up because we'll we'll work on that. Okay. Hi, Nikita Hooper. How are you tonight? I'm doing fantastic. I'm just sitting on the back porch, relaxing while I'm here. So I'm doing wow. great. Oh, wow. relaxing. relaxing. How does that work? Does that work? I don't get to relax. Well, I don't know. I just do it. So, uh, you know, I'm in the meeting and I'm relaxing. We're, so it's a non-stressful environment. Does that make sense? Yep, we're glad that you're yep, here. We're glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us. So this is what I'm gonna do. So this I'm gonna, 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 gonna get started. Vladi, you might want to go rescue go. Iris. Somebody, yeah. So, you might want to go rescue Iris. She's on Teams. <laughs> yeah, I, I sent her a message. This is the like second time, but I'm gonna have to call her. All right, yes. So so um, I'm going to start warming up for tonight's meeting. I have a little presentation. My goodness, look at this. More people are showing up. Hi, Kwana. How are you? I was afraid for a minute. I thought I might be here by myself and everybody, all the important people came. So for those of you who are not here on Tuesday, I'm going to kind of give a quick recap of what we did. And then I'm going to try to uh, answer any questions you have. And then we're going to go enjoy our holiday weekend. Is that OK? So this is part number two of us talking about, oh, let me get it to the beginning. Us talking about programs and some of the things we do. And so I'm going to share my screen now that I activated something. Once I can figure out how to do that. There we go. Share screen. It is the presentation. There we go. All right. Let me move this stuff out of the way. Is that, can you guys all see that okay? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Yes, we okay. can see it. Yes. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. So I'm just going to try to run through this. This is so funny when you start working with these PowerPoints. Because now I have stuff that I don't even know what to do with. Oh, that went over there and go over there. Okay. Stuff got in my way. So a couple of weeks ago in our meeting, and a few of you might have been there for this meeting, but a few of you might not have been, um, we we started talking about our programs. And, and again, one of the things I, I will say is that as much as if we been kind of meeting and coming together, we really have only been focusing on getting our programs out in the community for a little over four months. This will be our fifth month of actually doing that, which I keep trying to remind our team means that we're still putting it together, even though it would be real nice if we could roll it out, you know, on the, the you know, spur of the moment, but it really does take a while to do that. But often, one of the reasons that it takes so long is that people say, well, we can't do that right now because we don't have the right people or we don't have enough money. We don't have a program. So one of the exercises that we did a couple of weeks ago that I will share with you that you may want to, you know, just we'll toss it around for a minute here is what, what I call overcoming objections. So if you don't mind, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Uh, let's talk about any one of our programs. We're really talking about the youth program, mental health program, our program to provide services in the community. Um, and let me ask you, what would be one thing you think could be a problem? And anybody uh, can speak up or you can put what you're thinking in the chat and either Vladi or Kwana will read it to me because I can't actually see the chat for where I am. So does anybody have any, you can either unmute yourself and just give us one, give thing. Us one thing. Funding. 
funding. Yes, so funding. Cap, yes. Uh, running capital. Okay, so okay. so operating so, so capital. Operating capital. So so, so the reality, so the reality, is, reality is, is that's oh you might want to mute yourself. I think I'm coming back. So so yeah, that that's one that comes up. Okay, what's another one? Uh, I've been wrote mission based capacity uh, capacity and resources. Yeah, mission based. Oh my goodness. Okay, yeah, having the capacity and the resources. So we got funding, we got capacity. What else? One more, maybe two. Anybody? Uh, community driven. That's the other suggestion from the chat from Edwin. How to get the community driving us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, probably the real, the real way I think is the idea of community engagement, right? I How was going to say, yeah, involved. participation. Yeah, that that's visibility. That's and what do you mean by that when you say stability? No, uh, sorry, I said visibility. Like oh, visibility. I'm sorry. People in the community knowing about us and, and trusting that, us as a resource. That's really good. So now let's just take those four. We had we had a few more, but these are good ones to start with. So the first question was write down what the project was. So for all, any of our projects. And the reason you just gave, you know, lack of funding, people are not engaged, we don't have visibility. And now the question is, what would need to happen? What would need to be in place so that would not be an obstacle again? So uh, now we're switching from looking at the problem to starting to think about what are some of the ways to remove or resolve or get rid of that problem. So who could give me one idea or two or three for when we talk about funding is a problem, right? Or funding is an obstacle. What would be some of the ways you might overcome that? Anybody, you can just jump in. Community fundraising. Yeah, do some community fundraising. Okay. Someone else, anything else? I know Edwin's on this call, so I'm waiting. Uh, we have a few things in chat. Can you hear me? No, go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, so project scope form and budget approval. Getting the budget approved. Okay. What else? Realistic and proactive programming calendar and timeline. Calendar and timeline. Okay. Create partnerships with investors. Ah, partnerships. Now we're cooking. What else? Anything else? You know, I was on a call today with someone and they were talking about their program and they said their program is all volunteer. You know, all of the people who work with them do it without worrying about getting paid. And, you know, there are several programs like that. One time I was working on a project at RAP and someone applied for a grant to you know, help, uh, women with um, mammograms and they put in you know how much it costs to pay for the mammogram but that's the only cost they put on the proposal and so the the board didn't want to give them the money because they were like well they didn't put in any operating costs so uh, my job as a consultant was to go and find out, you know, how can I help them get this grant, right? We really want to give them the money. I think that's one of the things that I should let you know. It's not that people don't want to give you money, it's that you haven't shown them why they should give you money and why giving you money is good for them. 
And so my job as a consultant was to go and talk to these people about, you know, where's the ask for this money? And I, I met with them and they said, well, John, we don't really have any operating. All of our people who work with us um, have good jobs. There are many of them lawyers, doctors, and they just want to help somebody. So they volunteer all of their time. So I said, well, what you should do is write a letter to the foundation and let them know that that's the case so that they'll understand why you don't have any operating costs. And we funded the program. I mean, we funded the program because um, we understood how it worked. But, you know, I think often we feel like, well, you have to pay people to do stuff. But that's not really often true. A lot of people really enjoy being generous with their time and their skills and their gifts. And sometimes it's just that we have to make sure we ask them for those. So I think that's a really good one. Anything else for funding before I, I move over to uh, the next one? Research government funding. Oh yeah, look look for, that's why I was saying, I, I knew everyone was on here. Let's let's look for some grants. <laughs> let's look let's look for some some funding out there because there's uh you know there's fifty thousand foundations in the foundation directory online. We should be talking to them. Okay, let's see. A second thing that I think people talk about was building capacity for the organization. So you know that not having the capacity is an uh, obstacle. So how do we overcome that obstacle? Um, offer training classes or partner with other agencies who deliver um, the training that we need. Yeah, I think that's that's really good, Kwana. Thank you. Others? You know, I was on today with a group of pastors. The first thing one of the pastors said is, look, if you need a place to meet, you can come to my place. You know, there are a lot of resources and capacity in the community, but we just haven't connected the need to the place. And so we call that asset mapping. Like we look at what assets are in the community and then we try to bring those assets and take the needs and priorities of the community and bring them together. So if you think about it, you know, a lot of the resources and capacity that we need are already around us, but we haven't connected the pieces. So I think that's really good. Is there anything in the chat? No, no. Oh, wait, sorry. Volunteers and internships. Yeah. What did you say? Volunteers, internships. I think, you know, those are excellent ways to both not just build up capacity in terms of now you have a person, but also to build up capacity in that some of those people who volunteer, some of those people who are interns, in turn, become employees, become you know, leaders of their own nonprofits. And that's a really good way to increase the capacity, not just of one organization, but of uh, all of the organizations. Any Anything else? I got one more if, if, if nobody has anything. I, I think it is when we network and build relationships that we also increase our capacity. You know, as I was talking with the uh, folks today, the pastors earlier today, I was saying if we work in solidarity, our voices are much louder than when we work by ourselves. It is critical that we be on one page together and, and let people know what we will and what we will not allow to happen in our communities. You know, when we work together, our voices really can make a difference. All right, the, the next one, this is really bad because I didn't put my glasses on, but I think it was community engagement, getting engaged with the community. 
So what are some, some ways we could overcome or remove that obstacle? Mr. Ebbs, can you please repeat that one? Sure. It's about uh, building a community engagement. It was like, what is, you know, how do we get the community involved? And uh, I think the, the term that uh, Edwin brought was community driven. You know, how do we make sure that what we do has the community in it? It's not our program, but it's the community's program. How do we make sure that the community feels like they have ownership of what we're talking about today? Um, I think part of it is staying relevant. Like it, it needs to be something that the community wants for and or has expressed a need for. Um, yes. And also is yeah relevant to the times. So like I know we were discussing earlier, probably this week, about how technology is really important. So like including some of those kinds of things like you know, I like that programs or events, etc. I think that's really good. Others? Um yeah. Uh, go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep going. <laughs> go for it. So I just you you we're talking about engaging the community. So how do you engage people? You bring them together. How do you bring them together? You have an event, maybe event in the community, right in the park or you know, at someplace right in the center of their community, at one of their churches, some type of event to draw them all to one location so that we can then um, meet them and become engaged with them and build relationships with them because then we can see, put, you know, see their faces and talk to them and offer them something. So I think us sponsoring some type of event to bring the community together would be a good place, you know, or something good that we could do. I think that's great. I, I think I agree. People, when they gather, it helps to bring them together. It breaks through a whole lot of barriers. Often we talk about how often people disagree about this or disagree about that, but there's a lot of things that we agree on also. So what we have to do is help people find opportunities to come together, to get to know each other well enough so that they want to and care, want to work together and they care about one another. And I think um, partially because of technology and how a lot of people are kind of locked into their phones and things like that. And I think partially because of COVID People really got isolated by that. I think now maybe more than ever, the idea of bringing people together and trying to work together and just even just get to know one another better is really helping uh, and, and people really are looking forward to that kind of engagement. So I think we might find that the community is ready for engagement. And I think that would be something that we can definitely kind of take advantage of. And so let me see, was there one more? Uh, visibility, I think, was the last one that I wrote down. Before you go, we had um, mutual oh. aid on the list. Ooh, I like that. I like that. And then um, I know Candace said about us hosting events, but being present at um, the events that the community is holding as well. Yep, I think that's really important. Anything else? Knowing who our co community is. You know, and I think it, when we talk about that being present at community events, a lot of times, again, you know, how do we get to, to know that something's happening in the community so that we can make sure we do get a chance to participate, right? So we have to find and tap into the ways that people share 
their information within the community, which isn't always easy, you know, to, to know. But I think, you know, I'm looking for community calendars, but I think the number one way you find out is the more you talk to people, the more likely you are to find out what's going on. So, and I think the last one was visibility. So anybody have any ideas about increasing visibility? It's kind of related, right? Yes, it is. And any thoughts, any ideas how we do that? I, I think having the events will help with that, like Kansas was saying earlier, but what else? Well, canvassing the communities, I think with, with flyers, you know, maybe going door to door. I know that after COVID, a lot of people are a little bit apprehensive about things like that. But I think if we just get together, I know one of the local churches, they once a year get together and do a walk in the community and people see them in big, large groups out in their community walking. So, you know, it makes them take notice. So it, it, perhaps we could just try canvassing in a community that we're trying to reach. And, you know, I'd, I'd had that idea of just going to people that I know and, and making them aware of, hey, I'm involved with We Are One United. Do you know about it? Can I tell you about it? Just things like that, sharing it with people, sharing it with people at church, sharing it with people, you know, in the community that you see that may, um, you know, that may, may need this information. So I think it's important that we just, you know, kind of make ourselves visible, wear your shirt. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and I'm going to say something that I don't often see, like, don't forget to share it with the people you work with or go to school with. Because even though you may say, well, they don't live in my community, sometimes something you may say is going on may be something that they're looking for. So don't be afraid to share it with people, you know, job, yeah. And yeah, you know, or in, in the classroom, because, um, you know, a lot of uh, people are looking for some connection and you may be that link that gets them going. So, so now well, we have a few comments in the um, chat. Ooh, good. Attending local meetings, volunteering at local events, serving on cities' boards and commissions, Ooh. voting, church yes. events, supporting your colleagues and friends' causes, identifying a cause that people will associate us with, uh, associate us with our vision and mission. That all of that. See. So now those objections that we had initially, when we turn it around and really instead see them as opportunities, right? Now, these give us some good ideas of what we can start doing uh, to go forward. And, and there's a whole system of doing that and it's called catalytic thinking. And the idea with catalytic thinking is that we can get really great results if we, instead of focusing on why we can't do something, start thinking about how we can do it, what, what opportunities there are, what new ways there are to do things. Um, this idea of cause and effect, like, well, just because we don't have a lot of wealth, doesn't mean we can't go out and generate wealth. We just need to be focused more on where we want to go instead of where we have been in the past in terms of scarcity and, and, and poverty. And I think when we do that, um, it helps us to wake up our dreams again. You know, when we start out as kids, um, we're very creative. You know, if you ask a kid anything they they feel like they can do almost anything you know like could you go to the moon sure it's not even a big deal i'm gonna go in my backyard and build a rocket ship tomorrow but as we grow up we hear a lot of negative messages and after a certain point we stop saying that we would like to go to the moon because we had so many people tell us what we can't do and not that many people telling us what we can do so if we create this kind of positive focus, 
then what happens is more favorable conditions will start to come. And a, a big part of it is we start trying to bring out the best in people. You know, often we talk a lot about the worst in people, but the reality is we want to work hard to bring out the best in people and not be focused so much on funding, but recognize that I always used to tell people the best way you can be sustainable in a community is to be doing something that they want to have. As long as they want you, they'll find a way to keep your business alive. And I think that sometimes we're so busy chasing the money that we aren't recognizing that it's really about helping people feel like they're going to be able to get their dreams. And, you know, so, so keep that in mind that when we create a favorable condition and we focus on how each one of us can show up as the best version of ourselves, then that's going to create a current that's going to start leaving, leading us toward uh, the results that we're looking for. Now, one of the things that I think I, I say all the time is that a lot of what we need is already in the community. But I believe that when we work together, and when I, I'm not just talking about people in the community, I'm talking about within the community, people from outside the community, people who don't even know anything about the community. But when we try to work together, then I believe that there is nothing we cannot do. I believe that people very heavily underestimate how much they can really do, how far they can really go, because they focus on where they were instead of where they're trying to get to. You know, my grandson runs in the mornings at school. And so he got a little certificate the other day, ran in a little 5K. And I said, you know, you 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 like running? He said, I really do like running. I said, well, it says on your certificate that you ran 78 miles this year. And I was like, you know, folks, I just want you to understand. I struggle to get to the bathroom and back, right? So just be real clear about this. The idea of going 78 miles could be overwhelming if you start out thinking that's how far you're going. But if you start out thinking, I'm just gonna do one lap at a time. But if I am true to this, if I'm consistent in doing that, then at the end of the year, I can have 78 miles of running. I think that that's pretty exciting. And that's the way we have to start thinking. Stop telling ourselves that 78 miles is just too far. I can only go five miles. You, you might only be able to go five miles today, but you might be able to go another five miles tomorrow. So when we work together like that, and one of the things I always love are the relay races. Anybody here like relay races, like the four by 100 or four by 400 relay races? Oh, yes. And when they work together and they, they have that, that handoff and they just people can give the most that they have and know that there's somebody else who's going to take that baton and go forward and that's the way we ought to be we want to be able to pass the baton from ourselves to the next generation and we want to be giving them the best chance to have the best result Is, am i making any sense Anybody? Absolutely. Yes. You know, and I think that we just think about, well, I can only go so far. But if I go so far and then Candace goes so far and then Vladi goes, does everybody see how much further we will get down the road? And it's going to be fun doing it together. You know, those are always the, I always call them the most fun races, right? Because at the end, you always see all four of the people crossing the line together. You know, they're all, they're smiles, you know, like we, we won. And that's what we have to do. We have to become uh, collectively enough to get whatever we want. And, and that comes from connecting with other people, people who 
you know, you you just you throw it out there. You don't know. You don't always know who's going to be the one to come alongside you. So you just have to keep on kind of casting out the net and see what you catch. Anybody got anything to, any thoughts about that? Any experience doing that in the past? This is your chance, share your story. Well, I kind of felt that way a couple of weeks ago in a way about my um, end of semester challenges. Mm -hmm. All the work piled up at once. It felt overwhelming. All of the songs I had to learn, different languages I had to learn, all the things. And when I looked at it all together, it seemed like just too much and that I have bitten off more than I could chew. But then when I broke it up into little pieces and I organized it and I just took it one bite at a time, I was able to get through and subsequently have passed all my classes um, and just have a few, uh, just one, one last assignment to turn in tomorrow at the end of the day. And so I, I caught up and I just had to stop and not look at the whole thing, but just look at it in little bites and approach it that way. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes just breaking it down allows you to get one day at a time, they used to say, right? Just take it one day at a time, take it one step at a time. Isn't there some proverb out there that says something about the longest journey begins with but a single step? You know, you just got to be willing to take the next step each time. And I think that when we do that with company, it's even better because we keep encouraging one another. We keep trying to help one another, you know, just come on, we can make it, we can do that. And that's one of the things I really like about the Special Olympics, when you see the kids with the runners next to them who are like encouraging them, you know, and it's just very, um emotional to watch them really do what everybody told them was impossible and i think somebody said that we always say something's impossible until somebody does it so why wouldn't you want to be the one who makes that happen any comments or thoughts Quiet, quiet crowd tonight. Anybody in the church beside me? All right, so I'm gonna keep going a little I, bit. I, I did, I did put a note in the chat. Oh, go ahead, Edwin. Yeah, one of the things I was thinking about while we're discussing this, I'm, I'm, I was glad. It's really great to hear uh, Candice and Nikita too, um, also in the chat. Um, but I was thinking about how we were talking about asset mapping. And, you know, like really identifying what our community assets are, you know, so in my notes, I said, you know, what are the successful sustainable models in our community that already exist? We, you know, we've already been doing that. We can continue and to identify them. But one of the things is, what is that criteria to sort of give us that sense of like, is it use, what is useful to, and how do we usefully or how do we do it in the most successful way to identify those successful sustainable programs. And I, I think I know that it has to sort of refer back to our mission, it's sort of community driven. But again, like how do, you know, what kind of criteria do, do folks feel are, you know, what is the criteria that's important for us to, in order to identify those sustainable models that can put, you know, one, and that's the whole thing I put, I actually put in the chat the idea of mutual aid because the idea of mutual aid is that, you know, we go to each other, we help each other in that collective way again, you know, either it's through, money, if, if that's one way, or just resources and talent, like we've been saying, and, in, in, you know, as we've been building, we are one united. So we bring in, you know, the, the talent, you know, the, the knowledge, you know, collectively, you know, then, then folks can, can deal with the everyday, right? I'm a great example that I bring up here, and, and Jade will probably understand this, in, in our neighborhood, uh, in, in Veterans Track, you know, a lot of the Filipino immigrants or Filipino migrants who came to, to live in and in our enclave really depended on the the kindness and like real compassion of their of their you know their, their compadres right they're the folks who they they um moved here to with or, the, or or those who they worked together with you know a lot of our families were coming out of the migrant farm working 
And so they were all following crops. So they actually had to su support each other. They had to make lunches for each other. They had to be, you know, help feed each other. They would grow, you know, the different um, vegetables that they that were sustaining their families without having to go always buy something at the store, that kind of thing, or providing the services or, or even the, the knowledge of what do you do next in terms of your immigration status, you know, the paperwork, or, you know, how do you get citizenship or how do you become, you know, a, a, a citizen, you know, someone who's here in the United States, but working with, you know, with, with what is what was called that alien status, you know, that kind of stuff. But, the, but every, what, what we always relied on was that we always relied on those neighbors who were providing that information, who would actually go with you, who'd maybe drive you to to the you know to the embassy to like get that paperwork done or or drive you to the store so you could get that milk or go you know or help contribute to that collective sense of like I'm going to help bring the kids to school this weekend or we could all go on a trip to whitewater and go fishing you know that kind of stuff but there's that mutuality that sort of is what I'm thinking about when I'm looking at asset mapping in our neighborhood like those I just listed a whole bunch of things but clearly they they're all could be listed in this level of what is helping in that greater sort of com you know community survival. So that I think that's one of the things I'm thinking about, and I think that catalytic thinking. And I know you brought this up before, and I'm so glad because I think that's where, you know, I think uh, a lot of times communities feel very insecure because they are in that margin marginal like status or underrepresented status. So when you feel you know feel that way, you feel like you don't have access. But the reality is that we do have access because we are able to actually speak to each other in our own, you know, if it has to be a native language or, you know, or you, if you don't, if you can't read, you know, that someone can read for you, that kind of thing. So I'm, that's where I'm going at with what I'm thinking about. And I think when we do this more collectively, we are one united, we're going to be able to really identify not just the people who are the leaders, but all the people who are doing all that work to help make sure that those you know, that, that the community is always driving, you know, that sort of level of improving on itself, or at least, you know, um, helping each other, helping itself out. Like we've been saying, how do we help others to help themselves kind of thing? That's good. That's good. Yeah, we're, that's very good. Anyone else? So I'm going to kind of keep moving because I, I don't want to keep you guys too late. But one of the things that I want to say that we said in our meeting, I think is really important, is too often it's easy to look at a program or a project and say that's who we are. I think when we look at We Are One United, one of the things that I like to say is that we are a community-driven organization. And what really drives us is developing people. In particular, we were talking today about positive youth development as kind of our, our, our real focus. And, and the reason that's important is there's a lot of different ways to do you know, what we talk about. And what people sometimes do is they find a way to do something and it becomes the way to do something. And it becomes the only way to do something. And all of a sudden, we go from being open and creative to being very structured and fixed. And we get clunky. We get slowed down. So it, there, there has to be room for innovation. There has to be room to grow. And I think sometimes it's like when somebody says, who are you? A lot of times people answer by telling the work that they do. But you are so much more than the work that you do. And likewise, this organization is so much more than just the programs. It's really intended to be a facilitator for the community to reach their goals. Uh, you know, we're really not like, we don't have this goal. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Our main goal is we want to be as useful to the community as possible, which means we have to listen to the community. We have to seek out and search out and, you know, dig out those priorities in the community. 
we have to help restore that confidence and vision, those dreams and ideas that, you know, we all have had, but often have felt like there was not a way to reach them. We need to, as they used to say in the old days, we need to get back to thinking that the sky is the limit, that there is really nothing that we cannot do if we put our minds to it. But we also have to build stronger relationships with one another. We have to uh, help to be generous with one another, with our time, with our talent, and with our treasure. Because generosity means I give without necessarily feeling like you owe me something in return. I think too often we create what I like to call contracts, where it's like, I'll do this if you do that. So I'll be glad to bring my program if you will do this. No, what we want to create are what I call covenants. I'm going to be here for you to help you achieve your goals. And that's the end of it. There's no condition. There's no payback. It's just our covenant is we are here to make and build better communities, kind of one person at a time. And so making that commitment sometimes means, you know, you got to walk that walk now. So a lot of people keep waiting for when is it going to be time for me to pay it back or you know, what we like to say is we don't want you to pay it back. We want you to pay it forward, right? Pay it to the next generation. Pay it to the person you see that you could help, that you can give a helping hand. That's really how we want to operate. You know, it's really a simple thing. Um, the more we give, the more we get. It really is just, it works like that. So I want us to be the most giving, generous, wonderful organization and not so much just be seen as, you know, someone else who's here for what they want. We, we really want to be here for everyone, you know, and that, that's how we become inclusive. That's how we throw off some of the issues. So one of the things that I would suggest when you're looking at what you want to do is what makes, you know, this community, this group, this population of interest to you and why would you want to work with them and how does it fit into your goals, your strategies, your ideas? Because if you ask those questions, you move from being just someone who kind of is there to do a job to being someone who is there because you care about the people. You know, we, we often say, we want to add value to the people that we meet each day. That's really our goal is how can we add value to each, every person? And so when I answered the last question, what would success look like? It's, it's a place where people are growing. It's a place where people are starting to believe in their dreams again. That to me is what success would look like. And I think when people have that, you don't have to worry about motivating them. You don't have to worry about um, how much you're going to pay them because people are growth oriented. They have a growth mindset. That's that's what success will look like for We Are One United. And so as I, I kind of bring this part of the, the, the slideshow to an end, I guess I just want to know how some of you feel about us trying to achieve that goal. Ready to work. That sounds great. Thank you, Candice. Others? Any thoughts? What would I mean, it I mean, I think 
Go ahead, Emma. Go ahead, Emma. I was just going to say, um, I mean, I think we we are already demonstrating that with even with We Are One United, we are we seem to be constantly growing it in, in good ways and it's exciting um when we first started to now there's been such a difference and all good things so um i guess if we can impart that on the community as well it will be successful like you say thank you that's great that's great anybody else Well, I'm going to say two things. First, thank you all for being part of this journey with us. It really wouldn't be the same without you. I think sometimes we underestimate how important our little role is in making sure, you know, I, I, I like art a little bit. And and there's a style of art where if you just use little dots to make the pictures on, I can't remember, pointillism, is that what it's called? Yes. See, Edwin is looking, he's like, gee, Mr. Epps actually knows something. So I love art museums. Did I tell you that, Edwin? I love art museums. And so one of the things, you know. Philadelphia has some of the best museums, by the way. Oh, oh now you're making me homesick. Um, you know, but I just really think each one of us brings uh, more to the picture. You know, we just, we make it more beautiful. And so, you know, knowing that I'm in this part of the picture with you guys is is really exciting and kind of, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Ms. Iris, did you want to say anything before we go? No. Um, just as excited as everyone that has contributed to this class tonight, uh, my heart goes out to the community and wanting to focus on exactly what you said, what do they want? So, you know, I don't know if a series is a, a survey going door to door like one of the other uh, persons had mentioned, uh, we have to get to the core of what the community not only has need of, but what they want. Amen. That's great. Thank you. Kwana, anything before we go? No, I basically echo everything that everybody said. You know, which I always like to say, it takes a village, and I feel like we are one united as a part of that village. So I'm proud of the work we do and uh, excited to keep on moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Jade, anything before we go? Um, not really, actually. It kind of, everybody kind of just went over the points that um, I wanted to point out. Oh, they stole your points. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's good. And Ms. Nikita, anything? I would just like to say that, like, I echo everything that everybody is saying and doing at this point. You know, um, I'm not sure if anyone read it in the comments, but community investment, you know. Yeah. They have it has to be a real buy-in that they know that they're part of leading this movement that's coming into their community. And over the fact I haven't been here long, but what I gather is people have come in and tried to do A, B, and C. And so oh, we're doing things differently. Thank you. Thank that, you. That's very helpful. Ms. Emma, anything before we go? Um, not really. I feel mean, like we've had a very productive meeting and a lot of really important things have been said. Um, 
All I can say is that I, f I have a good feeling about the direction we're all we're headed in. It'll get done pretty much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And Ms. Candice? I'm here. I'm okay. sorry. I was okay. I was leave I was texting Vladi a message. Oh. <laughs> and you caught me in the middle of texting her something. <laughs> That's all right, because I'm gonna call no. her next. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just, you know, I'm I'm just really, really I feel very humbled and fortunate to be a part of this group and to be able to just hit the ground running, you know trying to do something that I've, uh, you know, just real, realizing a dream. I, I've, I've, I've always wanted my valley, this valley, and I do call it my valley because this I, I grew up here. The, the Coachella Valley is in my DNA. I know it is. So I love it down here. I love its people. And I just want for our people to know the power with which, you know, they can really and truly live in this valley. They, they have more power than they realize. And we just need to get the word out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Ms. Vladi, it comes back to you. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm gonna pick up on Jade because I really like what she wrote in the chat. She said like, everyone helps everyone, I will help everyone. We are like one big family. And as a, someone who was kind of alien when I came in here two years, three, four months ago, and I didn't know anyone, it was the community that helped me. And it was no, it's, it's not like they were my friends or anything. They just met me, but people were really helpful. So if someone asked me like, what's the uh, best thing about here? It's the people, <laughs> because it's exactly this. It's like when you actually are able to help each other or you're just willing to help someone and the things happen. So it's definitely the, the community. And it's just kind of like a family feeling that a Coachella has. I think that's great. Edwin, you want to close this out? Uh, close us out? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I'm really enjoying this conversation because it, it really provides this level of one. I, you know, I'm going to I'm going to actually rewind on my closing comments. My closing is really ar around the idea of what I actually brought up at, at a virtual cafe that I, you know, when I was first invited to come speak about you know the 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 you know the neighborhood that I yep. raised in in Palm Springs and the Filipino community and you know what my, the organization that I'm part of uh, as well it's not again it's not a formal nonprofit called it's called Bayanihan Desert and Bayanihan in itself it speaks about you know the idea of being able to unite in cooperation to achieve a, a common purpose the it's depicted in in social realist painting and in contemporary painting of when uh, families, your neighbors actually help um, literally put the, your neighbors, you know, if your neighbor wants to move their home, you know, their home on, you know, that's made out of, 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 of you know, straw and, and bamboo or, you know, wood, that the, the, the neighborhood comes together to help carry that home to the location they want to bring it to. Maybe even out of like the, you know, the, the Kudibari co connection that we, we spoke about with, um, with the architect Marina Tabasum and, at uh, during the Desert X uh, team building that we did at COD. And then of course, Bert Batanga's like mobile tiny home idea. So the idea is that, you know, we, we could actually bring together, you know, you know, community to really work towards that common purpose. I think, I think um, w one of the uh, principles in Kwanzaa also speaks about, you know, of course, unity like in Emoja, right? Or um, co the collective work of U Ujima. Yes. You know, there's a lot of things that we can look at in terms of things that, again, these are words that came out of our, com our communities. They've been there forever. They, you know, we, we're just like, you know, we we, can, we we and we should feel empowered to the to the level of, you know, like in Nikita, you said a community investment. You know, there's a real sense of like how what we have known or um, what we have known or what has been passed on to us is very important. I'm going to just say this one quick story because it was after I went to the COD graduation last night. I went to go celebrate with uh, one of my friends and we had a conversation about um, issues. And I was really um, taken back because of the, the, the person who was making a comment about how um, certain things or social um, inequities now 
aren't related to what happened a hundred years ago or a couple hundred years ago. But I was like, yeah, it does. You know, we are, we are not disconnected from the hundred years, 200 years, 500 years that are, that those, you know, the ancestors and, the, you know, those what we sort of stand on the, you know, the, sh the shoulders that we stand on today. We stand on their shoulders because they sacrificed a lot and they, they actually provided all the different models and, and, um, and, and, and love and organizing and hard work and, you know, and being uprooted you know, on so many different level, you know, levels. I'm, I'm just being very general just to be sort of um, inclusive here, but we know why we are here. You know, a lot of times we're not asked, we don't get a chance to ask why with, with those that, you know, we know very close in our families, you know, why, why are we here? Um, but I think that's one of the things I'm really interested in how this conversation tonight is, is about. We, you know, we are sort of working, you know, we are one united is clearly about that level of coming together in that communal strength versus that in, you know, just relying on the on the one person. So our selflessness or community self or collective selflessness is about really pushing forward. So I appreciate the conversation. I, I, I took so many notes in our conversation earlier uh, around um you know the um during our staff meeting was very key also because we did talk about you know the niche and and sort of focuses and goals and um i can't wait to you know i, I know we're building it already together and I, I can't wait to keep going on and and um i look forward to being more involved in person too thank you edwin well everybody i just want to say again thank you for your time tonight I think one of the best parts of community investment is the fact that you invest your time because nothing's more precious than time. You can't, you can get more money, but you never get more time. So consider yourselves investors in this community. And I agree with you, Candace. It is one heck of a community to be invested in, which is one of the reasons I'm here. And, you know, I don't live here. I didn't grow up here, but I really see the potential and I really see what the promise is. And so um, I want each and every one of you to know that um, we're going to uh, make a couple of changes just for those of you who normally come out on Tuesday mornings. We're going to move those meetings so you'll be getting some word about it. But just don't show up at COD on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. We won't be there. Um, go have a good, long holiday weekend. Remember, it is Memorial Day, those who fought and died for our country. 